thing is, um, the textbook uses this horrible term when it's referring to the teeth of the case. But what's really actual cost? Right? What in the money of the day does it actually cost to do something? So I just use the term actual cost. I think that's better. Okay. So just keep these points in mind uh, when we're looking at this. Well, let's now ask the question, well, what about if we were to model this in terms of what actually happens? Or what actually will happen in terms of real costs? Well, the first observation, and if I go back to my slide here, which looks at, in terms of just teeth of case, the actual cost of running the team greater than a quarter million a year, I need D as an interest rate if I want to ask the question, what's the present value? And remember, the definition of present value is, if I've got a future obligation, how much cash today does it take to meet that obligation if I can earn that specified D rate? Okay, that's what a funded position is about. So then what I want to do is I want to ask the question, how much money do we need in 1994 to run the team for the next 50 years? So I'm not going to do the perpetuity, just the 50-year model, because I want to use the formula uh, that will lend itself well to discussion. Okay. So the first thing is, if I've got 4% real, what does the university have to earn in terms of uh, the actual endowment? Well, that's my D formula. And it turns out to be 10.2%. And so in words, if the university actually wants to earn 4% real, the performance management of USAM has to be 10.24%. They don't earn 10.24% and inflation 6%, we're actually not going to be 4% better off. And I just want to explain that because that's a little, sometimes a little difficult. I want to look at a one-year investment. And I want to ask the question, well, is that 10.24% really uh, what we need? So one year investment. And let me just start out with $10,000. And the question is, how much money do I need a year from now if I want to be 4% off better rate? Okay. Well, I want to start off with what I'll call the standard investment. In other words, I'm no better off. Well, I'm going to suggest that if inflation is 6%, in other words, if prices go up by 6%, and I earn 6%, so I'm going to multiply this by 1.06%, which implies 6% rate of return, I'm going to have $10,600 a year from now. Am I, a, am I any better off as a result of making this investment? Well, yeah, I've got $600, so it sounds like I'm better off but haven't prices gone up by 6%. And therefore, I'm no better off because I can buy the same basket of goods and services a year from now that I could now. Now I can buy them for 10,000. A year from now, I need 10,600. So the first part of it is to suggest that if I earn only 6%, I'm standing still. I'm no better off. Okay. Is that okay? Because that, that's the key to this. Okay. Now, let me ask the question, what does it matter? What does it mean to be 4% better off? Because that's my definition of real. Okay. So a real return reflects being better off, I can being able to buy more stuff. Well, if I ask the question, if I say I want to be 4% better off now, today, doesn't that mean that I need 4% more money? So if I want to really be better off now by 4%, I need 400 extra dollars. That way I can buy 4% more stuff. But now, I want to be 4% better off a year from now. Okay? Because that's the definition, right? I want to be 4% better off a year from now. And how much money do I need? Well, isn't this $400? Aren't the prices associated with that 400 going to increase by 6% as well? So I'm going to suggest that I really need not $400, but for, so I'm just going to take this, I really need $424. Right? So, I need $400 today to buy 4% more. Prices go up 6%. I need 424 a year from now. Which suggests that I need $11,024 a year from now to be 4% better off. Okay. 
well, what rate of return on investment? Well, I need a le I need ten thousand and twenty four dollars on a ten thousand dollar investment. I need ten point two four. That's what that's about. So if I'm earning ten point two percent real, I can buy a year from now four percent more stock. Okay. This is the investment viewpoint. That's okay with everyone else to sleep on for stock. I also want to look at it from a pricing point of view. Okay. And from a pricing point of view, uh, I'll bring this down for a second. From a pricing point of view, let me look at it this way. I have $10,000 now. Actually, yeah, please. Over there, are we trying to say that 6% of the inflation rate or 4% of the inflation rate? Okay, good question. Okay. So here I'm defining I to be real. And I'm saying I want to be 4% better off. Okay. My J is inflation. Six percent. Okay. So when I take this expression here, I'm using the six percent rather than the four percent, because I'm simply asking the question. I don't want to be any better off. I want to be able to buy exactly the same what I can buy today. How much money do I need? Well, if prices go up by 6%, I need $600 more. Okay. So that is the 6% here. Okay, that's key. Okay. I'll show you from a pricing point of view in this side. And this 4% is the I because I want to buy 400. I want to buy 4% um, more. I need today to do that $400 more. That $400 goes up by 6% as well as prices go up. Therefore, this is the combined amount of money I need. So this is from an investment return point of view. Okay. 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 Uh, it might be a trivial for this problem, but let's say we had more terms. If we inflate the money before we calculate the interest, does that make a difference? No, no. I'm going to show you from a pricing point of view. Hold on to that question for a second. Let's say I've got thousand dollars now, and um, I'm looking at buying um, some widgets. That's just an economist term for something, and they're ten dollars a widget. Okay, I can buy today. I can buy a thousand. I can buy a thousand, right? So a thousand times ten dollars is my ten thousand dollars. So I've got a price today, $10. So my money today can buy $1,000. Okay. Same thing. If I want 4%, if I want to be 4% better off in a year, how much money do I need? Well, I'm going to suggest to you that for me to be 4% better off means I should have an investment that will allow me to buy. 40 more widgets, right? 4% more. Okay. In that case, my investment has allowed me a purchasing power increase of 4%, a real return of return. So, 4% real, now this is my demand, right? I want to do that 4% better off in the, in the widget department, therefore, I need enough money to buy 1,040. Okay. So, okay. a year from now, how much are widgets going to cost? Well, if they go up by inflation, like everything else, they're going to cost 6% more. So the median wage is going to cost 1060. So to buy 1040 worth of widgets, well, how much money do I need? Well, I'll we'll buy it together, and you come up with the same number. Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. And the key difference is, the tangible being better off in terms of actually being able to buy 4% more versus the monetary side of things, how much better off do I have to be in terms of dollars to be able to do that? Two different things. Okay. So if I'm going back to my example here, if I'm holding our uh, University of Toronto Asset Management accountable to 4% real return, then they better earn 10.24%. Therefore, 
terms of the money that's actually flowing in, that's my applicable interest rate. Hence, when I'm trying to ask the question, how much money do I need today? Z is 10.24%. So, let's have a look now. The team cost a quarter billion in 1994. So in the first year, 1995, if I just go back to this. Sorry. Yeah, in, in the first year it cost a quarter million. Next year it's going to cost a quarter million one plus J. Or six percent more. And so this reflects the increase in the amount of money the team needs just stand still. And this is the investment term. Right? This is how the university is going to be able to grow that money. And the present value again talks about the funded position. So let's, let's have a look. So over the next 50 years, the cost of the team will grow by 6% a year. Not really large inflation, but think about 50 years from now. He needs $4.6 million to do exactly the same that it cost a quarter million dollars today. So the compound effect of inflation is quite substantial on the number of dollars you actually need to get things done. That's why the bank can't is keen on keeping inflation in a rough So that is now my actual cost. So those are the T's of K. And the interest rate I'm going to use is C. And that will tell me how much money I need. cost as it goes up by um, 6% a year. Well, how do I go about doing that? Well, something that goes up by a percentage, fixed percentage each year is uh, probably a geometric theorem. And uh, this is just an example of where a geometric series is going to be useful, but it's not quite in the right form. These cash flows of this business situation are just slightly different than what the geometric series would allow me to use directly. And so I need to do some adjustments. So let me just talk about the geometric series. The geometric series basically has a cash flow at every time period end. It starts off in time period one with a number. And that number grows by J percent each time period. That's essentially that. And the formula tells you one time period before the first cash flow how much money you need. Okay, so that's it. Well, what do we have in this problem? Well, in this problem, if I just go back to the previous slide, we've got that quarter million dollar number in 1994, but the first year we're starting is 1995. Of course, the formula can't handle a 1 plus J on the first term. So why don't we just take it out? Why don't we say that if it's a quarter million dollars in 1994, it's going to be 265000 in 1995 because prices have gone up by 6 and therefore, I can take a 1 plus j out of all of the terms because I've basically taken a 1 plus j and multiplied it by 250. So now, I have something that looks identical to a geometric here. Okay, a number, and then something growing by j off the end time period. So we're going to minus 1. And it's 6%. So I can value this very simply now. I can just use p given a1 where I've got three parameters. I've got D, what the university is going to earn actually on the endowment, 10.24%. I've got the growth in the cash flow, 6%, second parameter, and I've got 50 years. Okay. And you need, of course, to use the formula for that uh, from the textbook. Plug in those numbers, and you get 5.4 million. It's exactly the same as the previous example. Or if I should say the previous way of doing it. So here we're reflecting what's actually happening. Whereas here, we're doing a model. And this is the, the model is usually good enough. And from an engineering point of view, this is normally what we do. You know, as engineers, we're not good at forecasting inflation anyway. So let's just take it out of the picture and make life easier. So virtually all of the examples you see in this course will be this constant dollar approach. Well, stop any questions. Please. So the answer is uh, always the same. 5.37 million for the ones before as well with job and Yes. Yes. Because it's, it's not a just a coincidence. Right? No, no. Okay. It's a model. It's a model. And um, that model, because I'm taking inflation out of both sides, the time value money 
and the price increases, they cancel. And I would rather do a problem this way than have to do a problem this way. Okay. It's a good enough one. Now, just to follow on to your questions, if no one's got any questions, I've got a question. When will this not work? So here I'm showing two methods. The easy way, constant dollars, real rate of return, and then the real world. And I'm showing you, for most instances, it's going to work. What do I assume, what do I need to assume to make these identical? Inflation rates don't change. Inflation rates don't change over time? Yeah. Well, actually, if the inflation rate changes, the interest rate is going to change as well. And they will be self-canceling. Right. So on an engineering economic model, I can have different interest rates each year, or different inflation rates. Of course, investors, if they think interest rates are going to go up, they're going to bid up uh, the cost of, of, of capital. So, no, we're not going to, that, that will probably even have a minor effect, because they're self canceling. What do you think? Inter interest, interest rates are greater than, I, don't, I never thought of that one. I have to, I'll have to, that generally doesn't happen. So I is greater than J. I'll have to think about that one. I've not thought that's an interesting, but I don't know. The answer is I don't know, but that's not likely to happen. Okay. What do you think? Okay. Um, okay. So if, if an engineering project, let's say my cost of capital is 10.24% and my project pays 9%, what am I going to do? I'm not going to do the project. Right. So in this example, if I can earn 10.24% and I still want to do this, what do I have to do? I have to ask the alums for more money or we're not going to do it. Okay. What's assumed here is something we call inflation neutrality. In other words, in this case it's easy because there's only one cash flow. But think about an engineering project that has a whole series of cash flows. Method one works if all of the prices go up for all of those cash flows at the same rate. In other words, it's inflation neutral. Think about an example of two alternatives. One is labor intensive. In other words, it uses an awful lot of labor. And the other one is equipment intensive. Spend a lot of money on equipment and you don't have to have a lot of people around. Now, if I do both of those, method one, I'm normally going to get the right answer no matter which method one or two. But let's say I've got uh, a situation where I'm expecting inflation to go up by 3%. And I know I've got a labor negotiation underway. And I know that the union's in a really strong bargaining position. And unless I cave in and give them 6% wage increase, I'm probably going to you know, have a very long strike on my hand. And so I'm probably going to cave in and give them 6%. So now I've got everything in the model going up by 3% except for labor. That now means that these methods are not going to be the same. Because if I do them in method, the way method 1 tells us, Implicit is that labor is going to go up by 3% in the labor intensive option. But it isn't. It's going to go up by 6%. And therefore, method one is going to understate the cost of that. Okay. Whereas method two implicitly is going to go up by 3%. So as long as more or less all the factors go up, including my revenue at the same rate, it doesn't matter. Have one factor distinctly uh, higher or lower, and then I have to actually explicitly calculate the cash flows uh, and the actual and the actuals for all of them. But generally, of course, that's never the case. Please. What about the one? Yeah, you probably can extract the present value of just that stream and see how much extra it's going to cost. Would be one way of doing it. But if you blindly just went in and used method one, then you're going to get the wrong answer. So you have to be you have to understand how this thing works and what's assumed. And you're just finding a clever way around that assumption. So yeah, it's an additional cost, so we'll separate that out and then figure out what the additional cost of that option is because there's a lot more labor in the labor expensive option by definition. So just keep that in mind. Okay. Okay. Um, now I just want to one more example. Now I just want to um, make sure everyone's on board in terms of all of these symbols. Okay, I've got, okay. Let's say, I've got um, an investment now. 
and let's say it's January 2011, and I want a one-year investment, risk free. So I'm, I'm putting my money away, or I put my money away in January, and I'm putting it away for a year. Okay. And I've got a thousand dollars, and the bank is going to promise me a year from now the term deposits. It's a fixed term. I put my money away for a one-year contract, and the bank says 1050. So my rate of interest is going to be 5%. Okay. Now, question, is that I, is that J, or is that D? In terms of the simple response, think about that. Okay. So I'm getting 50 more dollars. Those dollars are actual dollars, right? So that's going to be D. Everyone okay? Because that's the actual prevailing interest rate. Now, how much better am I off? Am I better off 5%? Well, under what situation am I better off by 5%? No inflation. Zero, right? Well, fat chance. J is going to be greater than zero. Prices are going to go up, right? I mean, that's just almost taken for granted. Let's say it goes up by 2%. Well, I can use my, you know, D equals I plus J plus IJ formula to then figure out what I'm actually making. So my actual return in that situation, remember that cross product. I need more money to buy the same amount. So if I'm looking at this investment, Remember, I don't know what my real return is going to be when I make the investment, right? No bank will guarantee me a real return because that means that they're going to take the risk for inflation. The depositor always takes the risk for inflation. The bank says, yeah, we'll give you 5% more money, but we don't guarantee what you can buy with that. And that's the way it works. So I'm going to, looking forward, predict <laughs> what inflation I think is going to be. If that's my prediction, then I'm going to be 2.9% better off. And from that point of view, I'm going to decide whether this is a good investment. This is why when we normally see, and just to follow on your question, we normally see the fact that I, let me get it right this time, is greater than J. Right? Because going forward, if we all think that J is going to be 7%, I don't have a number here, but this, I can tell you this is negative. No one's going to deposit money. So on a going forward basis, we expect I to be greater than J. Okay, and taxation, of course, will mess this up as well because interest is taxed uh, very highly in this country. Okay, so again, bank doesn't guarantee a real return. You take the rest of the deposit. Yes, sir. Stretcher. Uh, I the oh, 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 I made that mistake, didn't I? Sorry. Good. Thank you. Didn't I mean to say that? Yeah. You confused me with using I. Sorry. Thank you so much. D, the actual rate, has to be greater than J. Yeah. Because that's what we're talking about here with 5%. Thank you so much. Um, before when D was 5 and J was 2, how did you get I? Okay, um, this one here. So I'm saying um, D is 2%, and therefore I is going to be um, 2 point whatever it was. Okay, we're just using this relationship here. Yeah, but if you plug it in, I is 1. Shouldn't be. I plus J plus IJ. So here's J. Right? Okay. Um, you know, I take the I out and I've got a 1 plus J and I divide. You have to be worried there. Okay. okay. So just keep in mind, okay, who takes the risk? And again, in these sorts of problems, and for some reason or other, the students always find inflation uh, sort of confusing. Um, just keep in mind that we've got some prices that are going up, but we can model that in terms of 
price is not going up and use the real inflation. I use the real rate of return of the company. And that's what the company is. Okay, now I'm just talking about my, uh, I guess my last topic uh, in terms of basic financial skills, which is uh, bonds. Remember we talked about long-term financing, both on the equity and the debt side. This is more on the corporate side of things in terms of raising money. On the equity side, we came up with a fairly simple model uh, to come up with how we might value a stock and determine whether it's overvalued or not. Here we want to talk a little bit about uh, the equity side of things and, and see exactly um, where, where the uh, cost actually is and how we determine it and how prices for bonds are determined in the marketplace. Uh, I'm going to use U of T as an example. The University of Toronto was the first Canadian university to go to the bond market to raise money. What we used to do was whenever we had a need for a building or something like that, we raised three million there and four million here and five million there. And in this business, there was a volume discount. In other words, the transaction costs of raising three million dollars are very substantial. So if you can do a capital plan and say, well, we need 160 million dollars over the next four years, it's far cheaper to raise the 160 in one fell swoop. And uh, this was part of the initial um, the new college. 26 million of that for the new college building, and that's how it's not funded. Okay. So UFT went to uh, the bond market to try to secure this money in terms of a very large amount. Now, what's the process? Well, you know, UFT really doesn't know the debt market very well, not particularly good at uh, assessing, well, how much can we possibly get, how little can we possibly get away with in terms of interest rate. So they uh, engaged three uh, intermediaries, financial intermediaries, to basically uh, find, find the money. So they've married need with money. Okay. And uh, we call this a syndicate because essentially there were three um, financial institutions that each took a third of this issue. Okay. And what do the financial institutions do to this process? Well, the first thing is they know where the money is. Right? They got the positives. Okay. Secondly, they have a good sense of the marketplace because they're working for us, because we're in the commission to figure out well, what is the lowest possible rate we can get away with and still get $150 million. And they also provide what we call an underwriting or insurance um, function. In other words, once we sign on the dotted line, okay, the issue is $160 million. For the sake of argument, we pay them a million dollar commission. We get $159 million of cash. But then they have to go out and sell them. If they, and we'll see why they might not be able to get $159,050 million for these bonds, they take the rest. So underwriting basically means these intermediaries, and this is why you're paying the fee, a portion of the fee, take the rest in terms of issuing the bonds. So if things bad happen in the marketplace, they take the rest. We get our uh, 160 bond at the commission, $159 million for the same value. Okay. okay, so so that's the first part, the act of finding the money and the process. Now, second part is assuring investors that this is a good uh, investment. And since we've never done this before, um, we, were, we can have our books rated by these rating companies like Moody's, for example, or Standard & Poor's. So we opened up our books, indeed, to Moody's, uh, which is an, uh, an investment product, oh, sorry, it's a credit rating corporation. And they determined that just the U of T is credit worthy. They gave us, I forget the rating, AAB or something like that, better than the province of Ontario. And they sort of observed that, you know, we have $8 billion worth of real estate downtown. We have very little debt. And we have students that are willing to pay a fortune to come here and continue to do so. Therefore, we're likely to pay this money back. What does the lower debt, uh, risk mean? Well, we get a better rate in the province. So this whole process basically we signed off on 6.78%. Okay. And we'll show you if the cash flow is um, when, we, when we talk about the actual valuation. Now, some terms. Well, remember, bonds are long term. So we're going to pay back the money in 2031. Okay, this was done uh, 2001 with the issue date. Now, senior, unsecured <coughs> debentures. Okay, well, first of all, I hope you remember we talked about debentures. This is not a mortgage. right? A mortgage bond would be that we actually pledge certain buildings. So if we didn't pay, they could come and take them. Here, debenture means it's simply on the financial strength of U of T. We promise to pay and everyone believes us. So we don't have to secure it. Unsecured debentures, I'm not quite sure that's sort of a redundant because a debenture is by its very definition unsecured. 
So maybe this is just for people who don't understand these things but have $160 million to spend and just say, well, it's unsecure, just to make sure. Senior, this is the first one. So if U of T ever got into trouble, this bond issue would be the one that would get the money first. And we've issued three more cents. They are what we call subordinate. So if we ever run out of money, this gets paid first. The second issue, which is subordinate to this, gets paid second. The third issue, subordinate to those two, gets paid third. So this is a pecking order. And of course, the further you are down the totem pole, the more the risk, the more that we have to pay. So this is the best interest rate that we got because you know, one, we're going to pay and two, there's no one else standing in line in front of us. So we sign on the dotted line. And uh, we had some difficulty initially deciding what to do. We thought from a marketing point of view, wouldn't it be great if parents of U of T students could buy these bonds and have a part of U of T as well as helping pay for tuition? Okay. And we thought of selling these in $5,000 denominations, but think about how much marketing and effort and work that is to sell the in $5,000 chunks. It's very, very costly. So we opted to go with institutional um, large pension funds, large uh, investment banking houses that had this money that wanted to secure um, cash flow. This went up for auction, or this went up for sale, I should say, at 9 a.m. in the morning. By 9.07, it was fully sold out. And we had four customers, all of them around you know, 30 to $50 million. And they paid this rate. So we got the money, we built our building at a new college as well as a bunch of other buildings, and uh, it was the cheapest money we so that's sort of the process. Yeah. And companies are no different. They will use financial intermediaries, investment banks to help them secure the money. Now, let's talk a little bit about how it works. Okay, I've got um, a cash flow here and uh, just some terms. I have uh, the principal amount, which is simply the face value. In other words, the amount that I borrow is the face value, which is $5,000 on this very simple bond. I'm sorry, sure maybe I should just. The reason we're going to talk about this is three reasons. Obviously, from our debt equity discussion, we're going to raise money back. It's going to be another way of uh, defining this or giving another illustration of this term equivalence because the purchase price of the bond is simply uh, the equivalent uh, amount of the future income stream at the market rate or the bond yield. And when we get to project analysis, the, the solution procedure here is exactly the same as figuring out what's the rate of return on a project, an engineering project that we call the internal rate of return. So we'll talk about that um, technique here, but it's directly applicable to chapter four in the IRR, internal rate of return. So we'll spend a little more time than we should perhaps, but it's just for these three reasons. Okay, so I've got the base value of the bond, $5,000. Okay, so we're just selling now, in this case, um, a cheap bond, or an expensive $5,000 bond. So I've got base of 5000 That is what is printed on the bond, and no matter what someone pays for that bond, that is what they're going to get back. So bonds will sell at a discount, they'll sell at a premium. We'll, sh we'll show you that in a second. So face value, 5000 The bond rate is printed on the bond. In this case, the bond rate is 8%. And it can be payable semi-annually or quarterly. It's simple interest. This is the one exception to the compound rate. Simple interest. So if this, for example, were a semi-annual bond, it would be 4% or $200 every six months. Okay. And the bond rate, no matter what I pay for it, is applied to the face value. So I can buy this bond for $4,500, I'm still going to get $400. 8% face value. That's the key thing to remember. It's printed on the bond, that doesn't change. Okay. So it's long term, so I get a maturity 10 years, okay. at which time I get the 10th interest payment and I get my money back. That is basically the way a bond looks. Now, first observation is if I have a rate of return that I'm demanding on this investment to be equal to the bond rate, how much am I willing to pay for? Well, as it turns out, it's the face value. So if I pay $5,000 for this future cash flow stream, I need the bond, my rate of return will be 5%, excuse me, 8%. Also, well, well think about if I give them 5,000 and I get $400 a year, 8%, and every year 
They give me 8%, 400 bucks, and then they make my money back. Well, am I not earning 8% on my investment? The answer is yes. So at the bond rate, the face value is equivalent to the future payment stream. And that's just what these numbers show you. Yeah. So the value comes from the interest, as well as giving my money back. The present value of that, of course, is less, but I've been compensated for that time of waiting by the interest and the sum of space value. Okay. So, let's just say that this company is very, very happy with us, and they go off and print them. Two weeks later, they come back from the printer, and they try to sell them. And no one's willing to pay $5,000. <coughs> okay. So they, they have these bonds, and no one's buying them. Unlike U of T, where it took seven minutes. Maybe we actually had too low uh, an interest rate. We should have charged a little bit higher. Maybe we could have sold them in and out. Yeah. That's a question. Yeah, sure. Um, these numbers would have inflation in it in the sense that that 8% yes. is the D. Okay. And so people would not be lending an 8% if they thought inflation is going to be 10%. So, what you're observing is that these things don't change, but under the contract, we pay, this bond pays $400 a year and gives you back the money. The inflation part comes in that if inflation's high, that 8% might be higher. Okay, so, when an investor looks at this, they're looking at the three things. They're looking at um, postponing consumption, they're looking at risk, they're looking at inflation, and there are four things, and they're looking at your tax. But those are the four things that go into determining whether they're willing to buy that bond at 8%, I bought at $5,000. Okay, so. Well, you're, you're, you're basically, if you pay $5,000 for this bond, you will earn exactly 8%. Right? And if you think that inflation is going to be 4%, your real return will be more or less 4%. If that's good enough for you, then you're going to buy the bonds. If it's not good enough for you, you're going to go somewhere else. Okay. So, so in that 8% is compensation for inflation. Okay. Nothing else changes because that's your contract. 8% of face value. So they can't sell it. They got them, they're, they're sitting on the marketplace and no one's buying them. Well, what do you do when you can't sell something? You lower the price. 4900 no one's buying it. 4800 no one's buying it. 4700 you got a couple of new ones. At 4500 oh, I'm running out of time. At 4500 you can clear your entire $1 million worth of this because you've got them in $5,000 pieces. Well, think about if I can spend $5,000 for this, and earn 8%, if I spend less, am I not going to earn higher? So no one's wanting to buy this bond at an 8% rate of return. When it gets discounted, the rate of return's higher because the interest payments don't change and you get paid back face value. So something must have happened in the intervening time between when it was printed and when it went to market. Two things company specific thing or a general economy. If, for example, inflation all of a sudden jumped by two or three percent, no one's willing to buy the bond at eight percent, they want a higher rate of return. So it could be economic conditions that have made this bond at eight percent not not very interesting. Or it could be company specific. Let's say there was a you know a flight uh, which had half the company's executives on it and it could slam into the side of a mountain. Half the executives of this company are gone. Is there more risk in this company? The answer is yes. Do I still want to buy the bond? Not at eight percent, but pay me more. Maybe I do. Okay, so you can have company specific, or you can have economy general effects that will affect the price. So what I want to do next day is talk about that a little bit more. Figure out exactly what is the rate of return, and then see what that means.